The book of James is a wonderful call to maturity in our life. And it's also a, a book of incredible wisdom uh, for us. I, I, find it all, I find it almost comical that I'm talking about wisdom this morning on the day of the time change. That uh, I ain't got to ask those guys what they were thinking. But uh, um, it, it's good for us to, to spend some time here. Um, if you want to turn, we're still in chapter 1 of the book of James, and uh, I'll be reading from the fifth verse, uh, a couple of verses there this morning, James chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. Gracious Father, I thank you this morning that you have given us this opportunity to be here. Father, I am I'm humbled by the opportunity to speak your word. I simply ask, ask forgiveness for so many times I step aside of wisdom in life. And I thank you that you continue to give me grace and forgiveness. And I pray that as we dig into your word this morning, that we would not just see the word and un even understand it, but that we would practically apply it to our lives today. Help us to think and help us to be more like Jesus all the time. And it's his strength, his power, and in his name that we pray. Amen. I want to back up as, as I start here for, for just a second, and I'm going to read a couple of verses uh, from the first part that we looked at last week, because I want to show you how all of this is, is all coming together and, and fitting together. And I, I've chosen to, um, most of the texts that I w will read this morning will be from the New International Version, but I'm taking a couple of texts uh, from a paraphrase that, quite honestly, I really like this paraphrase in many ways. It's it's the J.B. Phillips paraphrase. It is not easy to find um, because J.B. Phillips, quite frankly, has many views that are, are just way off, uh, way off base in Christianity. And so I, I, I don't really hesitate to use the passages I'm using because I think he does an incredible job of paraphrasing the text at that point. But I think if we use the J.B. Phillips uh, translation, as a matter of fact, out of all the Bible uh, software packages that I have, none of them have uh, Phillips translation. That's how uh, scholars have come to view Phillips. But he, he did have a way of putting some things. And so I'm going I'm to go from the second verse on, uh, just reading a little bit um, from the Phillips paraphrase. He says, When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your face, faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. And we know the Apostle Paul would say later to the Roman Christians, where I think is just an addendum to this. Paul would say, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. He's saying, look, these things that come into your life, the trials that you come into your life, are all for the purpose. And again, I put this other passage here to echo um, the Apostle Paul's words to say, look, everything that happens, everything that happens, God uses for his, for, for his good and his glory and for our good as well. The trials that come into our lives are there to make us more like Jesus. They're there to make us more, and we tend not to think like that. We tend to think that Trials happen because maybe we stepped outside of the will of God, or we, we would like to avoid all, all, all kind of trials, and, and there are enough preachers on television and, and around the place that are, that are going to tell you, you know, if you come to Christ, then everything is going to be smooth. It's going to be smooth sailing. That's just not the truth, because the Bible teaches us that God is going to use trials to build us up and to make us more like Jesus. Now, so James knows 
James knows what he has just said in his own teaching in verses 2 through 4, where he says, these trials come to build you up. These trials come to test your faith so that your faith is, is going to eventually produce maturity, produce Christ-likeness in your life. Now, he knows that he has said that, and so the next thing that he writes down with that in mind is in, is, uh, actually in verse number 5. And he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. Now, that's a familiar passage, I think, to a lot of us. If any of us lacks wisdom, we ask God. And <clears throat> I think rightfully so, we apply that to a lot of areas of our life. Uh, what job uh, should I choose? I ask God for wisdom in that. Or it, job changes, or uh, marriages, or even relationships of any kind. We ask God for wisdom. And I think that's an appropriate use for that. But even more than that is within the context of this passage. He's talking about as God brings these things into your life, these trials that are for the purpose of producing maturity in you. If you lack wisdom, if you don't really understand, if you don't see how this is going to fit, then you need to ask God because there's a process that's going on. <laughs> as a matter of fact, it's going to be even more apparent as we get next week. We're going to deal with the verses uh, uh, we're going to deal with some verses farther down the passage in this, but to see how it all fits together is an important part of the process. Now, this is a challenge to say, oh, the, pro the, the problems, the, tr the trials, those tests that are coming my way, uh, I, boy, I, I see that God, it's a challenge for us to think that way. I mean, that's just counter to, to the way that our brain works. And so this morning I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to set us up with, with three questions uh, and the answers to those questions about some things that I think help us through this process. Now, the first question is, uh, the first question we want to ask is, is simply this, is what do we need? Okay, that's the first question. What do we need? And the answer is, we need wisdom, right? What do we need? We need wisdom. Now, wisdom in the Bible, understand this, is, is that wisdom is, 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 is very different, I, I, I think, than, than what we tend to see uh, in our society today. And James says, look, if you, if you lack wisdom, you need to ask one. Now, I wonder, and boy, this is a perfect time for this, is how much have you heard the word wisdom used over this last week? How often do people talk about wisdom? Probably not, not a whole lot. Because wisdom has been overshadowed, and certainly in the last few weeks, wisdom has been overshadowed by three things. It's been overshadowed with the idea of insight. We need to be more insightful. It's been overshadowed by information. It says we need to know these things. And it gets overshadowed, wisdom gets overshadowed by intelligence. I mean, we are out there in the middle of this um, situation. And, and the whole idea with this whole virus that, that seems to be that all people want to talk about is they want to fill us with information. They want to fill us with intelligence. And they don't want to talk much about wisdom. They want to talk about this, these earthly things. Now, I, I'm not here to downplay education because I think education is a good thing, but education is not synonymous with wisdom. Now, all I would need would be to bring some, some school teachers or, or maybe some college professors up here and say, uh, tell me, how, are the most intelligent people, or do they always show a lot of wisdom? And the answer is no. Because a lot of times people can be, be very intelligent and, and they don't have any real wisdom in their lives. But we get inundated with these thoughts around us and we forget that what we really need, what God has really called us to, is wisdom. But understand this, is that wisdom in the Bible is not simply a matter of the mind. It's not simply a, 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 an intellect thing but it is a matter of morality. 
Wisdom is about the behavior that accompanies our beliefs. It's the behavior that accompanies our beliefs. For example, Jesus would tell a story about two guys who built houses. One guy would build his house on the sand, and another guy would build his house on the rock. And we know the story. There's a guy who built his house on the sand. The winds and the rains came, and they knocked the house down. But the guy who built his house on the rock, the winds came, and the rains came, and they blew against it, and it, it stood still. And the conclusion, the conclusion that Jesus makes, and this is found in the 7th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Who hears these words, not only hears these words, not only the intelligence part, but puts them into practice. That's the wisdom part there. I mean, there's real no, the, that's the difference between the two guys. They both had the information. They both heard the words, but only one put, the, put it into practice. And that's what Jesus says, is this is what wisdom is about. Wisdom pops up all, all, over, all over the Bible is, is uh, 1 Kings 3. Uh, it gives us this beautiful picture of, of Solomon. Uh, when, when Solomon becomes the, the, the king and uh, Solomon is asked by God, what is, what is it that I can do for you, Solomon? And uh, Solomon's response is, is uh, just an, an incredible piece of wisdom. Because here, here's, what so, here's what Solomon says. says, Now, O Lord my God, you've made me your servant king in place of my father David. And that's the way it should be. But I am only a little child, and I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people. You have chosen a great people too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people. You see what he's asking for? Solomon is asking for wisdom. He's asking for wisdom. And, and so it, it's, it's absolutely no wonder in, in Solomon's life when Solomon then finally puts the pen to the paper and he writes down some of the things that he's thinking in the book of Proverbs. It says the, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, for doing what is right and what is just and what is fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the end. He says this is what wisdom is. This is where if you, at, if you lack wisdom, if you're asking God for wisdom, it makes a difference. Did you know that the Chinese government, one of the worst persecutors of Christianity, the Chinese government likes to have Christian people come and work in their system. They like to have Christians come over to China and work in the areas of uh, engineering and education and uh, medicine. They particularly like Christians to come into those areas to work. And it's not because they want to sneak them in and, and uh, then quietly do away with them. But they have found, they have found that Christians carry with them not only the intellect to get these jobs done, but they carry with them the morality to do what is right and just and fair. And so in a, in a, in a, in a scenario where, where they absolutely hate Christianity, they understand that there's a difference that happens when people use the wisdom of God. Wisdom is, is just an incredible thing. I was, I was listening to, uh, to several, things, several sermons this week and I came across one by uh, Alistair Begg, who is, uh, Begg is, is one of my favorites. 
And uh, Begg defined wisdom this way. He said, wisdom is acting in light of God's revelation of himself. I, I think that's absolutely profound. It's, it's, it's acting in light of God's revelation of himself. Or another way to say that is simply living God's way in God's world. Living God's way in God's world. That, that's what wisdom is. It's, it's learning to live God's way in his world. We need to live consistently with what God says. This is how the world works. And so if you want to live wisely, I don't think we tend to think of it that, uh, as wisdom that often. I think we tend to think of it as uh, religion or something like that. But he's saying if you want to live wisely, live God's way because it's God's world. We have to live consistently. And that's countercultural. <coughs> it always has been. Paul comes into the city of Corinth. And you look at the, the opening chapters of, of the book of 1 Corinthians. It's beautiful. Paul's saying, look, okay, bring me your wise guys. Bring your smart people. Let them stand up and tell me all the things that they know and all of the wisdom and, and all those things. He says, but I want to tell you about God. And as a matter of fact, he comes down where he finally says, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. He said, man's, man's wisdom isn't going to work. What you need is God's wisdom. What you need is God's wisdom to live out your life. But we, we gather these people who have all this wisdom around us. Bertrand Russell is uh, probably known as one of the greatest philosophers of his, of his time. I mean, you know, some of us were punished <laughs> into reading a lot of uh, Russell's work. And... Uh, uh, the kind of the culmination of Russell's mindset is, which which is is very strange in so so many ways, comes up in this statement that he makes. He says, "Only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair may the soul's habitation be built." It's one of Russell's famous, most famous quotes. Man, that is sad. And James says, no. He says, no, it's, 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 I mean, this is, this is really sorry. I mean, honestly, if we live this way, that's a very, very sad and a very negative way to live. But James says, look, if you're going to come to terms with the circumstance of your life, if you're going to come to terms with the things that you are going through, the trials, the tribulations that you find, if you're going to come to terms, you need God's wisdom. That's the only way that this is going to make sense. If you're going to understand that in the midst of all these pains and problems and trials and confusions and frustrations, that there can be joy... You need to, you need to have God's wisdom. And I have good news for you. Because that leads me to my second question. Which is the first question is, what do we need? We need wisdom. The second question is, what, what, what should we do? What should we do? You know what the answer is? It's real simple. We should ask God for wisdom. Say, is it really that simple? Yes. It really is that simple to ask God for wisdom. You know why? It's because we can trust God. Look what James says about this God that we ask wisdom for. He says this God gives every good and perfect gift. He says every good and perfect gift is from above, <coughs> coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. You want wisdom, ask God, and he's going to give you a good... God's going to be the same. You're not going to ask God something on Monday and get one answer and ask God on Thursday and get a different answer. God is always the same. I mean, this is our God. He is better than any father who knows how to give good gifts. This God gives good gifts all of the time. This is a God that we can trust. And so it's obviously logical that we would say if we lack wisdom... And I love the way that James asks the question. He says... <clears throat> 
Uh, by the way, if any of you lacks wisdom, I mean, who's going to say no? I, I, I don't, I don't need any, I don't need any wisdom. And he doesn't start out by accusing them, saying, "Oh, you're a bunch of, uh, you're a bunch of really sorry people who don't have any wisdom." You simply ask the question: If any of you lacks wisdom, you say, "Yes, I ask." And he says, "Okay, now that I've got your attention, that you need some wisdom, I'm going to tell you how to get it, and you're going to get it from God." So the way that you get it from God, you ask him. You ask him. I think that that brings up a a, a pretty important um, maybe side note is how do we ask God? How should we go to God and ask him? The text is going to give us some clues, but but let me just start at this point and say we, we need to ask him simply and we need to ask him properly. We need to ask him simply and we need to ask him properly. That's logical. We teach our kids. At least hopefully we do. Teach our kids how to ask for things. There's a, there's a right way to ask for things and a wrong way to ask for things. But you know the problem is, is that a lot of times we may teach our kids that and then we model something very, very different. On my birthday this past week, I went in for some fine dining at McDonald's. Because I wanted to watch. You know how people ask for things at McDonald's? Hey, I'll take a number two. Hey, uh, I'll, I'll, take, I'll, I'll take that number four thing with, uh, yeah, give me, give me fries with that. And, of course, supersize it. Some people ask. I'd like to work for one day at McDonald's. I don't think they'd let me finish out the day. But I'd like to work there for, I'll take a number two. Oh, will you? Oh, you'll have a number two, huh? Is that the way you're supposed to ask? But that's the way people ask. Hey, give me that. You think it's only you think it's only us low lives at McDonald's? Uh uh-uh. uh. Go to Starbucks, you see the same thing. Give me a mocha frappuccino latte. Give me this. How do we ask God? Because the problem is. So I think all too often we come to God the same way. And we don't really come simply and humbly and politely to God and we simply say, you know what, just God, give me this. Remember the story of the prodigal son? The prodigal son came to his father one day and he didn't say, hey, Dad, would it be okay if I maybe took my inheritance? Or, Dad, can I please have... Dad, I know that you're not as well as you used to be, and you're going to die someday soon, so can I please have my inheritance now? He he didn't do that. He says, give me my inheritance. And that's the the way that we tend to see it in our society, and when it spills over to God, it's, it's, it's horrific. The writer of Hebrews would say, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance. Now, he adds another element here, doesn't he? He adds the element of assurance with a sincere heart and assurance. I I can come to God. I come to God sincerely. I, I come to him sincerely. And I come to him confidently as well. James would say it this way in verse 6 of chapter 1, and he'd say, when he asks, you must believe and not doubt. Now, let me get into this, because this is important. Because, again, believing and, and doubting those things sound like a mental thing, and they're not really. 
Because the fact of the matter is, all of us struggle with some of the intellectual things, don't we? I mean, there are times when we go, is, is this really right? I mean, did Jesus really, did Jesus really die? I mean, those things crop up in our brains. I mean, I know you're in church and you're not supposed to say, no, I never have any of those. They crop up in our brains sometimes. Does this really work? Is this really right? Those things crop up. <coughs> and James is not saying if you have those doubts, if you doubt that maybe Jesus did or didn't do something, then you better not ask God for anything. That's not what he's saying. That'd be ludicrous. What he means by believing is putting our trust and our confidence and our devotion into God. Not just believing on the possibility, but resting in the truth. That it's gonna, and doubt's the same way. Doubt is not intellectual, but it's refusing to put our trust in a God who is so glad to provide for us. Again, let me go back to the way that Phillips put it. He said, but he must ask in sincere faith without secret doubts as to whether he really wants God's help or not. That is cool. Without, does he really want God's help or not? That's what he's talking about here. When we ask God, do we really want God's help or not? Understand this. James has already set the base. Is God is going to allow trials and tribulations into your life for the purpose of purifying you and maturing you and making you like Jesus. That's the deal. God said these things are going to happen. He's going to use those bad circumstances. The question is, do we really want to participate with God or not? But that's what it means to believe. That's what it means to trust. We come to God in the midst of trials with childlike trust, asking him to help us see things properly. He's got it all figured out. What we need to do is, is to have him give us the insight to see things properly. And it's at that point then that we realize that our tribulations are light and momentary afflictions that do not compare to the surpassing glory that is coming in Christ Jesus our Lord. That what we're going through means nothing in light of what God has in store for us. Now I know that it's not natural to view our trials and tribulations that way. I know it isn't. But we need to know that God has something greater for us on the other side of those trials and tribulations. And I'm not just talking about heaven. I'm talking about the changes that he makes into us and giving us life and life to its fullest. As we ask God's wisdom in that process. Are there trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged, the hymn writer would say. Why? Because we can take it to the Lord in prayer. And when we ask God for wisdom to live the way that he wants us to live in his world, we can't just go on and do the things that we want to do from there. We can't ask God for wisdom and get up off our knees and do our own thing. We can't. We can't. 
And so that brings me to the third question that I asked this morning. First question is, what do we need? We need wisdom. How do we get it? We ask God. And the third question is, so what will we find? And the answer is, it depends. It depends. See, if we're asking God for wisdom because we're trying to hedge our bet, we're going to get something very different. Remember that in verse 6? When he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, and he's blown and tossed by the wind. And he's going to go on and say, he's going to say, you know what you're going to get? He says, that man or that woman should not think that they will receive anything from the Lord. See, this is the full gospel. Because there are teachers out there who say, all you got to do is you just have to name it and claim it. Here are God's promises and say, oh, that's, that's my promises, and so God, you got to give me that. And this, is the, this is the flip side of that. Is it depends on how we approach God. You see, we can't go to God with two, we can't go to God riding two horses at the same time, going different directions. We can't come to God with faith and, and doubt. We have to come to God sincerely, open to what He wants to do. I mean, there are people who come to me and say, you know what, Lane, I prayed about this. And a lot of those people are even outside the body of Christ. They say, oh, I, 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 I prayed about this. And, and we got politicians who tell us they pray about things. And do you participate in the body of Christ? Well, no. Do you read God's word? No. Well, no. Then don't come to me and tell me that you prayed about it. Because it's all part and parcel of the same deal. You can't come to God with divided loyalties. It's not about intellectual doubts. It's about divided loyalties. You see, the doubter is the guy whose prayers and whose actions are in diametric opposition to each other. <coughs> They're at odds there. He prays one thing, but he rises up to do something else. Oh, I pray, oh God, I want you in my life. But here, God, I, I see this in your word, but no thanks, God. I don't want that part of it. We become like the classic prayer of, uh, uh, who was that, Augustine. Augustine who, who prayed, Lord, I want to be sanctified, but not yet. I know I need to be sanctified, but it's Friday night. And I was planning on starting on Monday. To receive wisdom, we have to say no to our own hypocrisy. We have to. We have to pray, God, I want your wisdom. But we can't say, God, I want your grace, and then get up like it's our own self-righteousness. We can't pray for wisdom and act like a fool. They have to be in line, our prayers and our actions in line. See, James uses those pictures. He says, you know what, if you don't do this, you're like somebody, you're like a wind, you're like the, the wave that's tossed around here and, and, and everywhere. Or you're a double-minded man, or you're unstable in everything that you do. But praise be to God, I got good news to start. <laughs> it's a good way to end. Because James would also say, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. I love that phrase. And it'll be given to him. God doesn't say, well, you know what? That's the same question that you asked me last week. 
He, he doesn't find fault. He says, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll help you through it. I think that probably a lot of you can relate to that fact and when you think back on your educational career. You think back on the teachers who made you want to learn and the teachers who made you want to run. And the difference was how they approached you. There's a part of me that would love to play the piano well. But I had a piano teacher named Mrs. Sullivan. She was mean. And she made me feel stupid. She made me feel like there was no way in the world that I was ever going to get it right. So when you talk to me about piano lessons today, I just think that's the worst possible thing that anybody could do because that's my frame of reference. Now, the fact that I'm not smart enough to have both hands go in different directions at the same time, that's not Mrs. Sullivan's fault, that's mine. But aren't you glad that God doesn't treat us like that and say, look, you moron. I told you. Nah. He says, Let, let's just go through this again. And he gently calls me back. He calls me to him. Simply and properly. And he gives to me generously. What a faithful, faithful God. I talk to Jesus every day. And he's interested in every word I say. No secretary tells me he's been called away. I talk to Jesus every day. And I never thought in my life I'd quote Johnny Cash in a sermon. <laughs> Donald Cogan was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Before that, he was a he was a, a, a local pastor, for lack of better terminology. And he was known for three things: for giving consistent advice to the puzzled, warm encouragement to the promising, and compassion to the perplexed. Let me say that again. Consistent advice to the puzzled. Warm encouragement to the promising. And compassion to the perplexed. And in that way, he was like Jesus. And that's what James is saying. Now he says, if, if, you, want, if you want wisdom from God, you've got to ask him. But you've got to ask him. You've got to ask him the right way. Now, I love what's coming next because he's going to apply this at a really unusual point in our lives. And we're going to talk about that next week. But I know that God wants to give wisdom to me. And Father, I pray that you would help me learn how to take it. Father, I, I, I ask that you would help me to understand your ways and to de determine to follow your paths. Forgive me, God, for so often when I just take things for granted, when I don't even come to you in the right way. But thank you for remaining there and waiting for me to come to you as, as you want. You're an incredible God. And all I can do with my life is to say thank you and to praise you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.